Welcome to Games Growth with Uptick, a podcast about the discipline of scaling digital games. We speak with industry experts and investigate trends to highlight the strategies, technology, and tactical methodology to profitably grow your game to massive global audiences. If you're interested in learning more, visit us at uptick.com. My name is Andrew Agosta, Director of Marketing here at Uptick, and joining me today is my co-host Warren Woodward. Thanks for joining us, Warren. Pleasure as always. Adam Lieb, CEO of GameSite. Thank you for joining us, Adam. Happy to be here. Antonio Garcia Martinez, New York Times bestselling author of Chaos Monkeys and founder of Spindle. Thank you for joining us, Antonio. Thanks for having me. And Adam Smart, Director of Product for Gaming at AppsFlyer. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for getting together here, guys. And we've been trying to wrangle this one together for a while. This is our attribution battle royale. We wanted the three of your companies to be on the same podcast because each of you represents an era and technology of attribution for marketers. AppsFlyer is one of the leading companies in traditional mobile measurement and attribution, probably the most mature sector. And then Adam, with his team at GameSite, the PC market has really been maturing the last few years in particular. It used to be a space where there wasn't a lot of measurement performance applied, but that's rapidly changing. And uh, Adam and his team at GameSite are definitely one of the driving forces there. And then Antonio representing a really emerging field that we're watching really closely here at Uptick with Web3 technologies, on-chain attribution, and how that is going to be a factor in this next era. Really unique opportunity. I haven't seen another panel or anything with these different cross sectors represented. Hopefully we have a lively, productive conversation today. So thanks everyone for making the time. So let's just jump right in with the state of play. Where are we today in the overall arc of the games marketing industry? We can just go in order of the eras that Warren just laid out. So we'll start with you, Adam Smart. Adam, from your perspective, what is the overall state of games marketing today? And how does what is the current state of attribution for mobile? Mobile's strong. Mobile's strong. It's doing well. Obviously, there's been bumps in the road in the form of a scan and ATT framework. And then we've got Google Privacy Sandbox just around the corner. But ultimately, the advertising is going very well. We're seeing spends increasing. You know, there was a drop after initially after iOS 14 and the SCAD framework was introduced. But we're seeing all of that come back to levels that it was before. So I think ultimately the mobile side of things is very strong at the moment. How about you, Adam Lieb? How is PC games marketing right now? And how is attribution going for you? I think similarly pretty strong. I think in the economic conditions force pretty much all companies to reevaluate things and double click on things and marketing, no doubt, one of them. I think in a lot of ways, it is I mean, certainly great for our business, but I think great for the industry overall that what that typically does is move marketing dollars from speculative, unprovable, you know, like super brand spin to more measurable, more performance efforts. That has definitely been a trend probably the last year or so that we really would, I'd say, seen pretty much across the entire industry is more focus on things that you can prove and the things that work. I think there are big games this year that are driving massive, massive spins. And I think what I'd probably say overall is that the winners are getting more money than ever and in games that are not quite getting there get cut a whole lot faster. For you, Adam, Lee, I think for many years now, it's been the norm that you can't even launch a mobile game without an uh, attribution provider in place. Historically, that's obviously not been the norm for the PC segment. What percentage of new PC launches do you actually see utilizing attribution in some way versus old school brand spend methodology? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that it would level set with one thing, which is the vast majority of PC games launched don't do marketing at all. So 0% of them have attribution in place. And I think that is something that's probably fundamentally different than on mobile, where you can't just launch a game on iOS, go, oh, well, hopefully it catches fire and we get tens of millions of downloads. That's just like not a thing. That is a thing in more traditional PC console gaming, where you can launch an indie game on Steam that catches the algorithms and the curation and becomes a huge hit that sells millions of units at a 40 or $60 pop and all of a sudden you have this massive success with a infinite marketing ROI. So I think that you kind of have to split games into those that do well, advertising, you know, traditional, I hate to call it traditional marketing, but digital advertising, digital marketing, as opposed to pure PR, or maybe there's some influencer stuff in there. When you segment that down to those that are doing traditional marketing, you're in the, I would say, early majority, right? You know, you're probably talking 60 to 70% is probably the amount that I would expect are launching with some form of measurement in place. But again, that is going to be in a subset of really the minority of games. Do you think that's changing now? Because I've seen 
a lot of companies that I'm talking to at the moment are thinking about platforms outside of mobile. And I'm just wondering if that sort of correlates with what you're seeing. And that's potentially bringing the more free-to-play model across to console and PC. Definitely. Probably 100% of the ones you're talking to, if they're coming from mobile, they have UA budgets, they have UA teams, they know what they're doing. And now when they look at a new platform like Steam or something else, they want to take the skills and expertise that they have and grow in their games go, great, let's do it here. That's pretty different than a traditional indie developer. It, it, on it's Steam. very different, isn't it? Yeah. You've, you've got like a completely different style of monetization there, whereby you have to keep that churn of users coming through in order to keep the monetization levels at the mark that you need them to be. It's definitely that, and I don't discount that, but I think a lot of it is also the people in the teams that a lot of 40, 50 person indie studios that are churning out games they don't have UA people. They don't have marketing people. They've not really built their company to be experts in that, where if you're coming from mobile, you almost like by definition are successful and good at growing your game with right. sort of like ad, ad methods. And they definitely are all going to be measurement customers of someone. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we got the PC, we got the mobile side. Antonio, what's your perspective on Web3, Web3 games growth as a segment and then how attribution fits into that? Yeah, Web3 is totally different. So by way of personal background, like I come from a totally normal Web2 ad tech background. Like I, I worked at Branch Metrics, which is similar to Apps Flyer. I was early Facebook and Twitter and like the whole Web2 ad tech world was my home. I got crypto pilled and then couldn't understand why nobody knew their CACs and LTVs in Web3. And I eventually figured out why that's true. <laughs> One, it's just they didn't have a way to actually measure it. And then two, a bunch of other reasons I could go on and on about. But if you look at now, a lot of the clients we have, they run the full gamut from like total on-chain crypto degen like, I, and by that, I include a lot of DeFi exchanges that like Web2 doesn't exist. They're never going to spend money on Facebook or Google. They have no idea what attribution is, frankly. Right. And then some games that are also in that bucket who are like in that play to earn world, Axie, Laguna Games, Crypto Unicorns, heavily on chain, kind of weekly on Web2, not so much. And then of course, Web2 games that are dabbling in Web3 and maybe want to do like an NFT thing and everything in between. Like literally the reason why I was late to the podcast, I, I was talking to one, an AppsFlyer client who's using AppsFlyer, but then has a bunch of stuff happening on chain and probably against a supernet and they can't measure it, right? Like they, there's like real monetization happening and they need to ingest that somehow. And so like right now, I think the Web3 world is either living apart from the Web2 attribution world, like it's a whole different universe, or it's trying to be complementary to existing Web2 ad tech that it's obviously not going to replace. And it's just going to add on the on-chain part that's missing. Antonio, let me ask you the same question about the adoption curves. We already talked about mobile being a default for years now. Uh, Adam Lieb used that analogy of you know sixty to seventy percent of a, a sub segment. Where are we at with Web three native products? And you can speak to both products and gaming in particular. Are most teams measuring today? Are we? Where are we at on that adoption curve? Yeah, that's wild. Mm -hmm. Web3 is heavily web. Just to give you an idea, I would consider obviously slightly biased Spindle to be the leading or perhaps only attribution platform in Web3. We don't actually have a live mobile SDK yet. We're working on one. We haven't needed one. It wasn't a launch blocker to anybody, even in the gaming sector. It was purely web first for like a bunch of reasons. Obviously that's changing, but it's weird. I was at Facebook in 2012 when, us when usage flipped 50% mobile to web. So to me, as with you, mobile was like the default, like you need mobile. And yet in client conversations, that was just, Nobody cared actually about mobile until relatively recently, actually. Yeah, I can say anecdotally from a lot of the Web3 teams that I talked to and we support here at Uptick, it's a part of it is just sort of where we're at relative to the last boom cycle of funding where now there's games that are starting to ship and a lot. it's also more of a, obviously a bear market for Web3. So we've seen a lot of teams prioritizing shipping mobile for gaming for Web3 products just as a maximum addressable audience now that they are actually shipping the products and now it's like okay cool now how do we get the users now how do we measure this so definitely seeing a lot more cross technology needs between all three of the spectrums that we're talking about today i think the other piece there is just apple and google starting to rationalize their web3 policies in a way that they were very very against early early on okay so the next big section i want to do a deep dive on this sort of covers everything attribution is data driven but the segment overall is how has the evolution of the data ecosystem changed for attribution? And this is really, really relevant for mobile. I imagine it's also relevant for PC. And then Antonio's going to have a completely different perspective because Web3 is just completely inverse of everything else that we saw in Web2. I think a lot of people who listen to the podcast have some concept of the answer to this, but still give it some table setting. To what extent have 
changes in data privacy affected attribution and impact of the games marketing ecosystem writ large? Nicely clarified. Yeah. The changes that we've seen have been very substantial with ATT framework, scan, and then with, as I talked about at the beginning, with the Google Privacy Sandbox. They really take away the user level data that historically everyone has worked with. A lot of, um, Antonio said it beforehand, everything went from web to mobile in the past, and it's all been user level data. So you, you took the user level data from web, you were working out who was doing what within your app. You've now gone across to mobile and you're working in exactly the same way. Instantly, I'll be very interested to know how that works when you apply that to, to web three. It's a very big mind sh mindset shift in having to suddenly think about non-deterministic methods and really trying to do more contextual targeting of users that, that you want to bring to your app. So in terms of your question was, how has it affected? It's, it's been a massive effect. And I think people are still really trying to dig into the the limitations surrounding it and how they can optimize their workflows surrounding this shift. Yeah, I think we could do a deep dive on Google Privacy Sandbox, but let's go around to get the top level view of everyone, and then we can come back and go more granular. So Adam Lieb, how has privacy evolution ex affected you as well in game side and on the PC marketing attribution side? Sure. Yeah, it's definitely different. Unlike mobile, there have never been strong user level identifiers like IDFAs. That's just never been a part of our world. When we started out six years ago, we started really trying to solve that simplest problem of user level deterministic attribution from ad click to game purchase or game install. What we discovered is it really just isn't that simple. You know, PC and console players take really complex journeys to discover games, to learn about games, to start playing games, and this click to install paradigm. Not that it doesn't work, but it doesn't really answer the full question that you care about, which is how effective is my marketing? Where should I be spending my money and what's working? So we look at things like community engagement, subscriptions, and game purchases, DLC, season passes, wish list, all these types of things are really important goals, events that we care about. And so we had to adapt that kind of like user level attribution to a more holistic combination of both user level when that data exists, as well as aggregate measurement mechanisms. And that's just something that we've had to adapt and, and, and do for a while, because I think in a lot of where we were born in the darkness, right? We never had the, the sort of IDFA, here's the perfect answer world where I think mobile lived in there's some golden age of mobile user attribution where there was just like, you knew everything all the time. And I think there were such amazing companies born out of that sort of perfect data world. We've never lived in that world and we still don't. And so everything that has happened in the last several years has just been tweaks on that. And we can talk more about some of the, the things that are going to happen in the future. But I'd say overall, it's probably how we think about user data and sort of privacy in the world we live in today. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think, again, I have more questions specifically about cookies and how that's changing. Let's come back to that as well. But I want to get to the table setting from Antonio, who's got the completely inverse <laughs> perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's weird in Web3. So like our V1 problem was similar to the problem that AppSlayer solves, right? Like we have a version of like what you would call one link. You click on a thing, but instead of figuring out what happened on mobile, which again, we're not trying to reproduce AppSlayer here, it's like, what do they do on chain, right? So you click on a thing and you buy the NFT or you stake the liquidity on a DeFi protocol. How do we thread that together? And so in order to do that, you have to thread together the sort of web two identity, whether it be a device ID, a device fingerprint, cookie, whatever, to the on-chain transaction, which is obviously wallet ID based. It's a whole different namespace. And the weird thing, so we've solved that problem, but the, the weird thing about what web two versus web three identity, as everyone here knows, the privacy paradigm is just different, right? Like on web two, it's kind of the real me, right? But then the transactions are either fragmented or considered confidential, right? Like if Amazon took everything I bought on Amazon and put it on a public registrar, I would freak out, right? But then you go to Web3 and there it's kind of not the real me. There's this pseudonymity layer between the device and the wallet ID, but then everything is absolutely public, way more public than anyone would be willing to put up with in Web2. And in order to have, let's face it, if there is a consumer Web3, it's going to be like Web2.5 or something. Web2 is not going away. There's always going to be mobile. There's always going to be web. But it just so happens that a lot of the cool stuff happens on chain. So how do you thread those together? It, it's interesting. I think initially it's going to be what we have, which is like this weird Web2, Web3 hybrid. What I would love to see, the very 30,000 foot pitch to a VC view is that publishers get a lot more wallet aware, a, a way more wallet centric. That's already kind of happening. Like literally wallets like Coinbase Wallet, Bitsky, whatever, like are becoming the portals to Web3. You have questing platforms, which are similar to offer walls in conventional gaming, except you sign in with a wallet. Potentially you'll have wallet aware publishers who just know your wallet ID because you logged in to do a thing, right? 
ideally the attribution and data would live on the blockchain layer because that's just more much more web3 native everyone just knows yeah i've got a wallet id in the same way that i've got a device if i really care i can change wallets and the whole thing goes away and that's fine but the reality is most users don't care that much they're incentivized to keep the wallet so if we kept the attribution in the wallet id space for us selfishly from the web3 side that would actually be a lot more cooler and interesting and frankly easier to navigate one thing that I'm curious to if you've seen, so we've seen from some of our Web3 customers that that like wallet to basically like user ID mapping isn't one-to-one, it's one-to-many, especially for the more hardcore players and traders, the people that you care the most about actually are the hardest to track and measure. If someone comes and they download, they play for five minutes, fine, that all works, people aren't fucking around with their wallets, but the sort of hardcore players, were you sort of seeing the same thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, we get asked that question a lot. Like, do you do wallet stitching, right? Like, are you trying to stitch together the wallets? In the example you cited, if you actually have a hard user, like if the app actually has a first party relationship with the user and knows and has an email or whatever, in theory, yeah, they could join it across different wallets. And I think, yeah, the true DGENs have many wallets, but I think when a consumer Web3 emerges, you're going to see a lot less of that, right? And also you're going to be incentivized to keep the same wallet because for example, we have a referrals product, rewards and referrals are like a big deal in web three. And so you're incentivized to keep the transaction record associated with that wallet. Cause you know that I've played this game enough and I'm getting the reward or I've jumped through these hoops. So I'm getting the, co- the token drop. In that case, people don't want to delete the wallet ID or use a different wallet ID. Look at Reddit. Reddit has like an NFT avatar thing. They assign you a wallet. I mean, you can change it. You can click six clicks into the UI and change the wallet ID, but basically nobody does it. Cause like. Why do it? Yeah, there's an incentive. Do you think that will change over time with the likes of GDPR and that kind of stuff? Do you think that will change this whole wallet stitching and the way that as a vendor, you can potentially have access to everything that's in the user's wallet and that sort of stuff? Visibility of it, not access to it. But do you think that will change over time? I mean, like I said, I think the Web3 privacy expectation, not the legal framework, just the user expectation is very different. They're totally cool with everything visible in the wallet. I, and I know... Co- like early adopter stage though, right? It's not general public, really. I think that's part of it, but it's also just the framework. Antonio said this a slightly different way, but your wallet in Web3 is not tied one-to-one deterministically with you as a human. You know, that wallet could technically change hands. And similarly, most people, if they're going to do something questionable, make a burner wallet or use multiple wallets for different functions. Not speaking from personal experience, right, Warren? Of course not. Yeah. People are comfortable with having that perfect information, but tied to a thing that's not exactly me, but rather this thing that I own. Just to double down on that answer a little bit, Adam, it gets weird when you're tying like Web2 identity, like a physical device, right? Like this with a wallet ID. And in the gaming context, I think users and developers don't care that much. In DeFi, it's obviously a lot more sensitive. We have a very privacy sensitive version of our SDK that does almost nothing on the Web2 side if all you want. And I think the way that Web3 natives think about it, Web3 really is quite different, right? Like you've totally inverted the, the paradigm of how data and computation works in Web3. They always try to build things in a Web3 native way. So for example, talk about, let's talk about referrals, right? Like I give you a link, you go play the game, I get paid something. And that's a model that exists in gaming, it exists in DeFi, whatever. In DeFi, they would try to put that on chain in some way such that it's not associated to the Web2 identifier in any serious way. To be blunt, it incentivizes you to keep the wallet ID because you need the wallet ID to get the reward. But they by building it on chain, it's, it doesn't exist as a cookie. It can't really be tied to me. Again, it's more public in a way. It's like, wait, you're broadcasting that you did this thing. But again, people are cool with it as long as it exists at that blockchain layer rather than at the personal or device layer. So we see this as like the cutting edge or at least one sort of divergent path of where technology can go. I wanted to bring it back to Adam the Smart and talk a little bit about where we are with the mass adoption products. Do you have any insight there as well in terms of where we expect privacy to be going forward? To your point about Google Privacy Sandbox, they were the ones in the beginning that started to look at Google Fledge, for instance, which is now the audience API, that really got a handle on re-engagement and that sort of stuff in a a non-deterministic type of way. So that just shows the level of thinking and the way that they're trying to help the industry be able to function the way it does at the moment. And I think that's a very strong signal to show that they're actually working with a lot of the larger companies within the gaming arena, within the mobile gaming arena, to really make sure everything is working in the same way. And I'm sure we'll start to see a lot more come out from that soon. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Do you think that we're going to reach a world where Apple completely gets rid of probabilistic 
attribution or fingerprinting, I guess, is more accurately described. I've said on my podcast that I thought that would happen a few times, yeah. And so maybe we're just inching inching closer to that reality. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. I'm, I guess we should be... I'm sure there's reasons behind the moves that they're making, and I'm sure that will all become clear at some point in the future. It's interesting just to see how divergent the traditional way that we're looking at attribution is versus the Web3 side. Adam Lee, I'm curious with you, we've been talking about cookies being depreciated for a while. I'm curious to what extent you see changes in privacy from the website or any other ways, that, any other touch points that you are ingesting currently affecting attribution going forward. Yeah, I definitely think that is the way the world is moving, whether that's because of consumer preferences or regulation, to some extent doesn't matter. That is the way things are going. I would say our sort of broadest belief is that there's the relationship between players and publishers is strong and a trusted relationship. And that sort of first party data is something that that players are broadly speaking, happy to have. And also the way that most regulation is going tends to be a pure opt in. Hey, if I'm sharing my data, as long as I know who I'm sharing it with, and I'm okay with that, then probably be on the kind of right side of any regulation that as far as I'm aware that is passed or even being worked on. And so I think that the kind of combination of publishers, game publishers, and sort of ad networks working together in this model where I think third-party data and third-party data sharing, things like cookies, broadly going away in favor of first-party data and first-party data sharing. I always kind of think it's odd. We have these conversations a lot where it's like, hey, everything's moving towards email addresses. And you're like, well, shit, that's way more user, (laughs) user PII than an IP address. But we're moving to a world where players are opting in and saying, here's my email address. And I think a lot of game publishers are rewarding them for that in in some way, shape or form. That email address is now able to be hashed and shared in a clean room with the major ad network and not have to worry about third party data sharing. So that seems to be the way the world is going. You know, I think our business is built for that and have been for years where we do uh, dedicated instances of our attribution technology for most of our large customers. So we deploy game site technology in their cloud. They collect process data. We're not a third-party data processor. And those relationships between players opting into data sharing is just with the game studio who they have a relationship with, not us who they don't know or want to know, or even ad networks where it's becoming clean room based. So yeah, I would say that's the world as we see it moving. Up next, I'd love to go a little bit more into some specifics around the state of attribution for gaming as a sector. And I'd love to start on the topic of convergence between the three platforms that we initially represented for the three of you of mobile PC and Web3. Clearly, it's not that games these days are, I am only a mobile game. I'm only a PC game. I'm only a Web3 game. There's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of moving between these technologies. Some utilize all three. So maybe to start, and Antonio, why don't you start us here? How do you think about Web3 as a technology sector related to PC attribution, related to mobile attribution. And we'll go around the table for that. Of what do you see the role of your current technology related to the other two platforms represented here? Yeah. If I were to cite the biggest conceptual difference between Web3 and either PC gaming or mobile, it's not even blockchain versus mobile native SDK. That's important, but at a conceptual level, a conversion event's a conversion event. And whether you collect it by firing a custom event to AppsFlyer, or by doing a thing on chain that we index, like at the end of the day, it's like a funnel, right? And you're just ingesting events where I think it gets really weird and freaky and I don't understand it. And nobody does, I think. Attribution obviously is a super important piece of plumbing because it feeds into a business model, which we've converged on CPA and CPI as the business model, right? And again, attribution tells you that capital T truth of what happened. This user came in and where did they come from, right? But to a reductionist sense, it's also telling you, like, do I pay Google or Facebook for the user? (laughs) Basically is what it's telling you, right? Because you can only pick one because this is the way the business model attribution works hand in glove with ads and we have CPA and you can only pay or maybe, or maybe app loving or whatever, or the open web, right? I think web three is going to be very different. There, There is no Google or Facebook sitting in the middle of it with an enormous consumer base that in someone, in some sense, controls the ecosystem. It's going to be much more open. It's going to be much more fragmented. It's going to be much more decentralized. L- let me tell you how. So again, we have an attribution system. We can tell you where a user came from Web 2 or Web 3 and how they converted on chain. Great. We also have a referral thing that lives on chain that actually pays the refer. Okay. So what's the model? Is it last touch? Is it first touch? Is it true multi-touch? Like what the hell is it? Right. To be honest, we don't get asked this question because people don't ask questions about attribution <laughs> to that level of sophistication inside Web 3, but we're already asking it. It's like, 
well, wh- which one should it be, right? And because Web3 has programmable money, like it, for better or worse, it's financialized from day one and arguably it's a bug more than a feature. But either way, like you can actually imagine a true MTA world where if you know a Facebook ad drives a little bit of value and an influencer drives a little bit of value and a wallet drives a little bit of value, we can actually pay all three. We don't have to have a winner take all attribution model, which I know is a constraint in the mobile world because again, you can have to pay either Facebook or Google or somebody else. And Web3, it doesn't work that way. You can actually, not to get all like weird collectivist and hippie about it, but it is the case that you can imagine a world where like true multi-touch attribution and also like multi-payout ads models exist because we could take a little bit of cut of the UA budget. The publisher could take a little cut of the UA budget. Maybe Uptick one day will take a little bit of cut of the UA budget as well as, as the agency, right? And so, well, then what does the attribution model look like? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated. Forget the deal, forget mobile versus blockchain. Like at a high level, what does the business model actually look like for user acquisition in Web3 to me is the big break with the mobile and the PC worlds. Right. Because at the end of the day, like for us as marketers, we're just really trying to populate that revenue column correctly, the R in our, our ROAS. And that becomes increasingly complex to do as games move to being cross platform and cross technology with both traditional in app revenue, maybe ad revenue, and now more and more with on chain events. Adam, sorry, I'd love to go to you here next. You know, Apps Flyer obviously built its name in mobile. You've been mobile first, but not mobile exclusively. You've historically had some products around, I'd say, finite scope PC attribution in certain segments. And then you recently made a big announcement actually at MAU, which was a couple of weeks ago, about a new initiative for PC and cross-platform. So how do you view the current state of like AppsFire's core and historical product related to these other technologies as the company matures? It's had to change a lot. I think people's expectations for gaming has changed a lot. I've got this great example of my daughter. She's nine years old. And the other day turned around to me and said, hey, I want to be able to play, I want to be able to play Roblox on the PlayStation. Why can't I, why can't I access it? And it, it's very difficult to turn around to somebody of the Netflix and Disney Plus generation and say, you can't, they haven't made it. So I, I think people's expectations and certainly younger generations' expectations towards gaming have changed a lot. I would have been fully content going out, buying a cartridge and putting it into the old Sega Mega Drive or Super Nintendo and playing that game until it was finished and then binning it and getting a new one or keeping it and getting a new one. I think now... The very makeup of games has changed and how people expect to be able to play them has changed. For instance, being able to play something on the go can then come back and sit at your PC and be able to just continue the same session. You can see from the likes of Genshin Impact, it's been huge. And obviously the massive Fortnite. There's so many examples now of this happening. And I think this is going to be something that we see way more over the next couple of years. I have probably a different take on that. I don't know they disagree with any of that, but I think that gaming is so big and sometimes we under appreciate how large it is and how much larger it's becoming to try to bucket things into like, this is gaming. I played maybe 150 hours of Elden Ring on my super rig PC that I built. I never in a million years want to play it on my phone and I can't imagine anyone else does. It's not that that's an experience that like, oh, well, you know, Ben, I didn't get around to oh, like yeah, building wouldn't a mobile want, port. Wouldn't you want some aspect of that that you could play on your phone? I mean, I remember playing Red Dead and when I first started playing it and it was really cool. And then you get the gun catalog on your phone or the, the catalog for items on your phone that you can sit and flick through while, while you're not playing the game or while you're on the commute to work or whatever. Uh, no, I mean, I think there's certainly some second screen experiences that are great and additive, but I think there are other games that are built for, and I think that developers spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours building these games for certain experiences and certain devices. And I don't think that's ever going to change. I think there's a different class of games. And that's my point about games is so large where your Roblox is a perfect example. I, I'm actually didn't realize Roblox wasn't on PlayStation. That is probably a fee structure thing with PlayStation more than any type of technical limitation. But yeah, I agree. There's a class of games that I think is built to be multi-platform, cross-platform, cross-play, any device. And that's awesome. And I have two eight-year-olds and those are the types of games they like. I still have the big screen built for experience. And I don't suspect those games are 
A, going anywhere or B, going to be like this cross-platform game in the future. I think that's just a great part of the industry is that it is so large that there's room for all of these types of experiences. And frankly, all of them are successful and growing and they're growing in their own segments as well. Adam Lieb, I'd love to send you for a related question. Even though the technology and adoption for PC console attribution is more in that middle stage, it's actually the most mature segment from a product lifespan. From from GameSite historically, why have you guys chosen to stay? I, th- and I think you spoke to part of this, but stay so laser focused in PC and console as a segment. And why do you think that there has been so little rival technologies to date um, that offer like viable solutions for what's such a clear need? Yeah, complex question that I, I will see if I can simplify a response. So I'd say the, the first is that it's an old industry, right? PC console gaming has been around for, I don't know, about 40 years at this point. And it, in a lot of the sort of way it is, is the way that it was. And that comes from distribution platforms, Nintendo, Sega, eventually Xbox and PlayStation being virtually the sole way to distribute a game, right? There was no idea of a direct-to-consumer relationships. Well, I put my game on Nintendo and they try to sell it for me. That has, of course, evolved in these platforms have all become open publishing platforms, but that's all in the last decade, maybe even five years for a lot of them. So the idea of this kind of like open platform marketplace where you can make, ship, and market your games is relatively new, unlike iOS, where from the time the App Store launched, like anyone could basically ship a game on there. So I think that a lot of the industry comes from just the historical nature of you know, shipping discs and the distribution costs of doing all of that and the difficulty in actually developing a game for a proprietary piece of hardware. So that, that I think put the industry where it is. And then now as it's you know over the last six years or so, since we started GameSite, we see the adoption towards performance marketing and measurability around, around marketing. They figure it out quicker because they've been doing these activities for a long time, but it, it is wild. Sometimes we'll work with a studio and they've been publishing games for 30 years and they go, wow, this is the first time we've ever really had a CAC that wasn't lifetime marketing over divided by lifetime sales CAC to do anything more sophisticated than that. It's an awesome experience, but it, it is still a challenging one for companies that maybe have been doing it a different way for a very long time. So I don't know, that's at least part of your question, Warren. I don't know if you... Yeah, I know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question. <laughs> Antonio, you started this round. I want to give you a final word here. Thinking about this idea, in mobile, historically, we've seen a ton of competition for measurement providers. And PC console, there's been, I would argue, like very few serious players over the years. What are you anticipating? What are the early signs that you're seeing in your sector? Are you anticipating a lot of competition? Do you feel like no one is going after the sector too much right now because we're in a bear market? Like, How are you picturing the future of your own competing solutions to what you're building at, at Spindle? It's funny, after we announced our round and were trumpeting attribution has arrived to Web3, there was a shocking number of companies who pivoted and started saying they were doing attribution. (laughs) And they don't use that term so often anymore. It turns out attribution in Web3 is actually really hard. And so I think a lot of people actually haven't built there. I think Adam was citing some of the historical reasons, right? Like reality is path dependent, right? (laughs) And if we had a different history, the present would be different, as it were. And I think the Venn diagram intersection of people with like deep Web2 ad tech expertise and Web3 DGENs is quite small, as it turns out. And I hope that grows, to be honest, but I think it's actually quite small. And it's no ding on the ecosystem. In many ways, Web3 thinks about data in a more sophisticated way than Web2, but like they don't know what attribution is, to be honest. They confuse it with analytics and they don't understand the distinction. Yeah, and it's like they push us to do things or one of the sort of truisms of Web2 is that a cut of data or a source of data is only valuable if it's an input to a business decision or a business model. And if it isn't, otherwise, it's frankly unimportant. A lot of the early Web3 data tools were like pretty charts, but you realize you can't target those people anywhere. There's no messaging in Web3. There's like a real publisher problem that maybe is a little bit outside the scope of this podcast, but like the publisher side of Web3 kind of hasn't taken off. You can build lots of interesting cuts of data because of course the data is in public. Again, it's totally different, right? Like a huge part of apps flyers value is that that you are the record of data that everyone fires data into you and you fire data into other people and you are the data switzerland and the, the kind of focus for that in in web3 that's been partially replaced by the blockchain the blockchain actually is the same database you don't need a gazillion postbacks flying around if everyone posts to the same database which is called the blockchain so in that sense it's great that said the database is not designed to be a marketing one and so someone needs to interpret that and again a lot of these subtleties i think is just strange like you 
Web3 is a reverse of Web2 in so many ways. Like in Web2, you had the rise of business models, CPM and CPC, which kind of barely worked. And then companies like AppSlayer came along or GameSite and said, oh, you know what? Like we need to quantify this stuff, right? Like some of this actually works amazing. Some of this is terrible. You need to have the ability to distinguish that and build an actual business model around that. That that hasn't happened yet in Web3. Like th there aren't people doing massive media deals that are poorly measured that is like taking traffic from an NFT market. I won't name names, an NFT marketplace to an NFT collection. Like those, that crossover doesn't exist in any sort of quantitative way. And so it's weird. Like in some way we've shown up and have tried to measure it and are trying to push the fact that, look, this guy is driving lots of value to this guy. Like, why don't you like do a deal? But it's... Again, it's weird. Again, history, like you used to be able to make a lot of money by just floating a token and launching a thing and that's it. You didn't have to worry about, if money is free, CACs are zero, right? And so no one cares to measure CACs, but suddenly when money isn't free, which it wasn't as of a year ago, oh shit, suddenly CACs matter, which is why we're here. But that's the thing that the ecosystem has made a transition from basically a world of free money and who cares about CACs to suddenly one where unit economics matter. So that's great. You're clearly articulated there's a lot of complexity that comes to the web three space very very different than the immense complexity that exists in the web two space i want to talk about that complexity and how gamers and games marketers should solve it and i know we're going to have different perspectives i think we all see at this point there will be pc focused games i hope i'm a big pc focused gamer but also assuming that we're going to have multi-device games as well as studios who are doing games across different devices there's a lot of complexity that sort of bakes out of that and so I go start with Adam. We can go around. Adam, sorry, we can go around the circle. What are the tooling and strategies that are necessary to adapt to this complexity in the gaming era going forward for the next couple of years? Call it. It's all about visibility. It's all about certainly on the mobile side, and I'm sure for Adam on console and PC side, it's all about being able to tie the ad to the install, the user that installed. So I, I think being able to see the tool set to be able to see that connection and to be able to manage that connection, especially if it's multi-platform, then it brings up added complexities of being able to see the same user installing on multiple different platforms and then tying all that together to know that the user is playing on PlayStation, Xbox, iOS, Android, that they have installed the game on all of those platforms that's going to become more and more essential over time. Adam Lieb, this is basically what GameSite is designed to tackle. Is that correct? I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, yeah. I think maybe a little different than Adam Smart's opinion, which is we believe that the sort of like fundamental goal of a campaign has to be flexible. It can't really simply be an install goal. And I think that's something that like, again, just ward out of like the historical nature of our business, which is that I'll think about a game like Destiny 2, which is one of my favorite games. The game has five business models. There's a free-to-play version. There's a premium version. There's seasons passes. There's DLC. And there's in-game purchases. Games available on four or five different platforms. The relationship between we're running this marketing campaign to the outcome we're trying to drive is super, super far from ad click sale. Uh, it's a very complicated you know, menagerie of player behaviors and actions and monetization events, which for someone like me, who I don't know, I probably spent $600 or something on Destiny over my lifetime. My install event was six years ago. They don't care about that. They, they care about understanding, well, what is the campaign that they're running now to reactivate me for season 21? What does that look like? And I play in season 20, and what does that look like for season 21? So we really think about that as a, a very user-centric journey to relationship with the publisher, whatever that is. And I think Web3, I'd be curious to get Antonio's thoughts on this because I think we, we think that is even more complicated in Web3 as what is what the hell is a user? Do they play your game? We have a lot of Web3 customers where the people spending the money are, have never downloaded the client. So if we treated the client install as the install event, this is the goal, well, they would be like, I don't give a shit about that. I care that people are coming into my ecosystem and they're purchasing NFTs or they're holding NFTs or they're trading NFTs. Those may or may not be related to a game install. That they may be, you know, the long term goal is that they will be, that the games will be fun to play and that we'll care about interacting with NFTs in and around those games. But today, someone might come to Sandbox, they might create an account, they might link a wallet, they might buy a piece of land and never download the game. So we really take that as for Sandbox, that is the goal for them, might be a web registration, maybe an account, a wallet link event. That might be the goal of marketing as opposed to an install event. Would, would that purchase through Sandbox be done through somewhere like OpenSea or is that directly through Sandbox? It depends. 
<laughs> that there are lots of both would be tracked before the user has necessarily Correct. installed on sandbox yes which i think for a game that i will not name the vast majority of their purchases happen without a it was a PC only game without a PC install event, which was really what they thought the goal was when they started working with us. Like, great, try to get people to install our game. And then they realized, I don't know, after a while and after a lot of money that like, if we don't actually care about people installing the game. Maybe we care about that this flow where they're pre-registering and they're doing these referrals and all the things Antonio was talking about. Th those are, that's such a different model than Destiny or maybe even a simple game that is just trying to do well, like, hey, come buy my game for 50 bucks one time. Add to that. I mean, it's a great question, Adam, that it's wild, right? In Web3, and this is all considered like a feature, not a bug. Like the user owns the thing and they don't even have to play the game. And to be blunt, like a lot of these Web3 games are basically like NFT speculation vehicles in which most of the game revenue actually comes from royalties, either primary or secondary royalties on the NFT marketplaces. So if you actually look at where the revenue is being made, it's not in the game. It's on like OpenSea or whatever the hell. And again, from this world, it's like weird. And like this seems suboptimal from the Web3 world. It's like, eh. Who cares? This is just the way it works. To be arguable, it could be more bug than feature in the sense that you design games because you stoke a certain speculative asset frenzy rather than actually building a game that you actually want to play. And it's true. If you go into some of these games, frankly, like sometimes the gameplay is kind of eh, but it's like, why is this so popular, relatively speaking? Well, because there's this whole financialized aspect to it. I think Xander raised the question. I I'm going to use the line, Web3 fixes this. The wallet ID thing, to be honest, like identity is key to all this stuff, right? Like how do you tie various parts of the funnel together, right? Which again, is part of the value that the AppsFlyer provides. In Web3, it natively exists as the wallet ID, for example, how much of the revenue is happening in game versus say on OpenSea, just the site one. Well, you can see it because it exists on chain. So we can actually tell you inside of Spindle Plot, you'd have it by channel and there would be like, revenue by OpenSea versus the in-game NFT marketplace, which some games have, Adam, some don't, because it means you have to drive your own NFT marketplace revenue. And why do that? There's like 12 other NFT marketplaces that have the bulk of the revenue. Like, why do I have to build it necessarily? Aggravation never really gets destroyed. It only gets transformed, kind of like energy. And so the weird platform split in Web3 world is like what chain you're on. And so suddenly what should be like pretty base level infrastructure, like whether you're running on AWS or Google Compute, actually assumes overarching importance in Web3. Because if you're a Solana game and Solana for a bunch of reasons is very different than Ethereum style chains like Polygon, it's just a very different experience. And you can't, I can't take an NFT that I bought on Polygon and sell it on Solana, for example. And so suddenly you do have this weird split and there's all this weird tribalism, which we take no part in between like Sol Solana game devs versus Polygon game devs or whatever, that instead of like PC console versus mobile, the split is like Solana versus Polygon. So like actually Web3 doesn't actually solve everything. It just transforms the problem into a different dimension, basically. Yeah, you touched on a good point, Antonio, which I think this is also, again, tied to the relatively young maturity level of Web3 and Web3 gaming as a segment. It really surprised me the first few times talking to teams when Uptick supporting a game team and getting to know them before we even worked together. It's like, well, what's your business goal here? Usually it's, well, we want to drive revenue through our game, drive positive ROAS. For a lot of Web3 teams, it's uh, we're trying to maximize uh, transactions of our token or just literally our KPI is driving up our token price. And while on one hand, it seems like completely removed and bizarro, if we think about how these, I think still very primitive models of Web3 game economies, how is that Web3 business making money? Ultimately, they have a bunch of their token and they need to sell it on market to produce revenue. So it creates these kind of weirdo incentives. I think that the model today is definitely not the evergreen model. It's just a 1.0 that people keep copy pasting, even though it doesn't work. But <laughs> those are the rules of engagement and success for better, for worse, for a lot of games in this primitive era. Can I comment on that? Because this is another place where Web3 goes off the deep end versus Web2. So we were working with like a questing platform, which again is like an offer wall, which is like the only native ad unit you have in Web3. And I won't name the platform, but whatever. And I'm like, dude, look, you can calculate ROAS and all this fancy CAC and blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, that's all great. And eventually this has to matter. But most of my advertisers don't give a damn about any of this. They're basically buying product metrics and they want to make token go up. They don't care about the ROAS, actually. They don't actually care. And I'm like, oh, my God. And we did a case study on Blur. So Blur is an NFT marketplace that kind of a latecomer to the market, but basically wrecked OpenSea, got a lot of market share by doing a token drop. So they, they <laughs> it's the most circular stuff they hinted at or that they're doing a token drop. Here's what you have to do to actually qualify for the token. The incentives were actually geared to drive liquidity, not just transaction volume, like literally just buying and selling on the NFT marketplace. And then they dropped the token. We calculated the ROAS, we calculate the retention. They're all terrible by conventional metric. That said, token went up and they stole enormous amounts of market share from the market leader. Can you call that campaign a failure? 
not really. And by the way, they didn't have the value in that token to begin with, right? Like that didn't even exist as a value pool, right? So is that a failure? No, just what ROAS mean has to change. Well, how does ROAS change? Well, it turns out in Web3, you don't buy users, right? Like in the conventional mobile world, I pay a CAC of $100 for Facebook. The user comes in, I have an LTV, and then they churn out. That is the life cycle, not how it works in Web3. You don't buy users, you rent them, right? And how do you rent them? You give them rewards again and again and again. So CAC is not a one-time discrete thing. It's an ongoing fee you pay on them. And if you actually look at user retention by those who got rewards versus those who didn't, you see very different numbers because you've retained the user by paying them constantly to stick around. And so that has to be baked into a way. And again, the real difference between Web3 and Web2 isn't the technical level of is it an SDK event or is it a blockchain thing that happened? It's these conceptual differences between what is CAC. That's the real That's the real differentiator. Yeah, I feel my anxiety arising as you're describing this because we think about the technologies that all of your teams represent here today and then go back to that concept of, I just need to populate that revenue column to judge the success of my marketing. And we think about all the complexity and nuance of PC marketing and if it's downloadable, if it's browser-based, all of the new obstacles being thrown at us in mobile with Apple, Apple's privacy changes, upcoming Google, and then all this weird, weird stuff from Web3. And it's like the marketer's job in some ways is getting so much easier with how much more automation and AI are taking over, but it's also getting so much harder. And like almost like our role as marketers becomes more and more as plumbers. It's less about pulling the levers optimally, more like, are we asking the right question? And do we have the our data in order to actually provide the answer to that question? Warren, I know a very good Web3 attribution platform that can help you with that. <laughs> so, well, I think the challenge is so much of Warren, I think you, you said it really well, which is like asking the right questions. We've had this conversation a bunch of times, probably partly with Uptick and then with a lot of our Web3 customers, which is like, how do you think about LTV? It's like, no fucking idea, right? Someone buys something today and then they don't interact with us for two months. Are they churn? Do we just write them off as like, that's it? Or like, no, they spent 20 grand on some land plot. We assume someday they'll sell it and then we'll get a 5% transaction fee. So is our LTV actually that plus 5% or not? There's not enough longitudinal data to have really any cogent idea of what that actually is going to mean. You can guess. It's funny, but like the first onboarding step we have with a client is like, what do you consider to be an active user? <laughs> what is the A and DAU according to you? And it varies. It's everything from buying and selling NFTs. It's holding the NFT. It's maintaining a long position on the DeFi exchange. So we have to go through and actually net out like a risk platform. Where Are they net long or short on the whatever the hell it is? And it's like all this wild stuff. And they're still guessing, right? I mean, it's not like they like actually know. They're just taking their educated guess. D dude, like having calculating revenue for our LTV calculation is often the first time they've correctly calculated their revenue. They haven't actually done it before. Yeah, we see similar things, which is somewhat disconcerting. It's like the core difference, I think, between the maturity of the mobile segment versus the evolving PC segment and then the future looking Web3 segment. So I'm talking a little bit about hybridization. What happens when we combine these all together? I'm not sure who to go for this, but does anybody have opinions about how we stitch all these things together? Maybe Adam Smart, you want to start here? It's been a minute since we heard from you. Yeah, it's, I've been fascinated. fascinated listening to the Web3 side. So. Yeah, there's multiple different takes because there's multiple different things going on. But exactly what Adam was saying earlier. You've got the, the, let's call it old school console and PC game, gaming studios which are creating the sort of almost standalone games but when it comes to games like Diablo 4, as we were talking about earlier, that's way more of a sort of hybrid between the two different models. Put that one aside. I think you've got a very clear path from the existing console and PC studios really building out and being able to use LTV effectively and then generate some form of ROAS. I think that brings a very strong case for advertising spend, as we've said before, being able to really generate and be able to see, visualize what it is that you're spending out and the return that you're getting for it. I won't say installs again, but the return that you're bringing back for it, that really is the ultimate when you're looking at hybrid matched with you have to get some form of visualization of where all of these accounts are installing because there's going to start to be a very big cross promotion path across the entire estate of a company. And that's the other really interesting thing is how do game companies 
think about multi-titles, especially as it comes to cross-platform. We don't need to jump right into that, but Adam, Lee, do you have thoughts about hybridization? Yeah, back to my general answer, which is like, Gavit is so big. There are a bunch of different answers. I think we see a couple of different forces happening at the same time. I think one is, I would call more traditional mobile publishers that are maybe struggling with user acquisition on mobile, privacy, Apple reasons, et cetera, and start looking at like, hey, where else could we go? hey, PC doesn't look so hard. And so I think there is a movement from, say, pretty much every major mobile studio to at least explore what that looks like. And then there's a bunch of different tacks within that range. There's, hey, we've got a mobile game. Let's just straight port it. Like built it in Unity. You can ship that on PC, start on Steam and see what happens. There's maybe the next title we build, we should build it to be a true cross-platform experience. And then there's the uh, most extreme, NetEase would be a good example. Let's buy a studio and build a straight PC only game and see how it works. And if it works well, we'll invest more in that space. Um, So I think all of those things are happening at the same time. So when you talk about hybridization, there's like... Yeah, it's exploding webs of complexity. It's exploding webs of complexity. And I think that they're all interesting and I think they're all viable and that they are all depending on who you are and what types of games you can make and what type of experiences you can make. You can have success. We've seen some of the more traditional mobile studios make a ton of money on PC on a really teeny user base because effectively they've moved the hardest core of their hardcore players to say, hey, you can now I'll play your favorite game while you're at work or while you're at school, while you're on a desktop. Awesome. It's not actually been a net new user acquisition platform for them. It's just been a like user monetization platform. That's a successful way of doing it as well as, hey, we're going to build a full hybrid cross-platform cross-play from the beginning game that has a genuinely fun experience on desktop or mobile. And then obviously we also see it from the other side, which is more traditional PC console developers saying, hey, there are a whole bunch of people who have phones in their pockets. (laughs) How do I get my game over there? I'd say the most successful cases we've seen to date of games like that have been where mobile is in essence a user acquisition platform, not the primary gaming experience or the primary monetization experience, right? It's like, well, can I get my game in front of lots of people relatively cheaply? And if they are hooked, they're now going to be a a forever player for me on PC. So there's a bunch of different, yeah, exploding webs of complexity. There's your answer, Sander. I think with the marketing side of that, it opens up lots of different methods from creative and that kind of thing and where you advertise and the audiences that you're advertising to or the segments that you're trying to appease it really opens up the door for trying new things on mobile advertising for instance on on google and facebook or the likes of maloko even to really drive traffic in a different way i mean you look at a lot of the a lot of the pc and console titles the advertising is very built up until the launch of the game and then it sort of stops if you were to continue that what does that look like and if you're driving players from ads from facebook from google from wherever you're going to start to see this sort of leveling out of users from the launch continuing and that may change over time the model of let's release a new version every year to let's update the current version and change it so you have the live ops going through the game you have the seasonal approaches to the game you have that form of monetization without having to release the next version, the next version, the next version. And we're already seeing that with some folks. Like, I mean, there's a ton of games that are already taking that approach, especially in the PC console space. Uh, Adam, Lee, you, you touched on something interesting. We have in our uptick games portfolio, we have games that use all three technologies represented here. And we see some really interesting data around for these hybrid economy games that have Web3 and traditional. We see very different behavior on mobile and PC usage. So what we've seen is, to your point, Adam, mobile can be very cost-effective as a user acquisition platform. We see a similar targeting, about a tenth of the cost for similar targeting types uh, if you're acquiring them through their mobile device rather than through PC. Okay, cool. So why not just put 100% of the budget on mobile? Well, with very good reason, for these hybrid economy games, we see that wallet connection is in the dumpster if you come in through mobile because there's so many additional extra steps you have to take. So we're still using a strategy where there's segments going where we're going for PC, where those there's those really highly engaged, likely to connect wallet users, and then money ball strategies where you can get cost-effective users through mobile, but you know that maybe they're only participating in the Web2 portion of your economy for the most part, other than a very small minority. So very early days. Yeah, can I comment on that? Just the hybrid thing. Yeah. So on the Web3 side, I think there's part of Web3, which is like the whole DeFi, NFT, DGen thing. And they're going to exist in like a Web3 only silo for a long time. They don't even think about Web2. 
and they don't have a presence there. I think gaming is going to be much more of a spectrum. You're going to have games who are still pretty strongly on chain and maybe only care about their NFT royalty revenue on some marketplace and less about the in-game action. But then you're going to have games which, like to Warren's point, are like a spectrum from traditional Web 2 to Web 3. And the question is like, okay, so how do you attribute, like how does the data work? We would be perfectly happy, Adam Smart, to fire server to server, custom postbacks to app flyer to record the on-chain data as part of like their global data picture. We're also happy to work with an uptick, or we've done this with agencies in which they actually are drawing data from app flyer and from spindle. And it's okay, like how do I get a total all TV, right? Because like there's something missing if you're if you don't have the on-chain part. And so I think there's gonna be a lot more weird and there's gonna have to be some aggregation layer that exists that kind of bubbles it up in some semi-systematic way. But I, I don't know what that looks like yet, to be honest. <laughs> Out of interest, why are there not more mobile games, but with the blockchain element of it hidden? So almost like Web 2.5, if something surrounding that, where you purchase through Apple or Google the, the in-app purchases, and then you have the option of connecting a wallet to it afterwards to do the export if you want to. Otherwise, it just plays as a Web 2 game. Yeah. They exist, to be clear. No, no, I, I meant, why are there not more? You know, why is this not a, a valid path? I think some of it, to be honest, is cultural. Like I, when I first got into Web3, it's like, why is the wallet so front and center? This should be like Google SSO. Like I just click a thing and it works. That's never been the case. A, the wallets were a powerful form of onboarding. They're also a major source of traffic into the actual DEXs. Like most, like a lot of Uniswaps is, is basically the wallets connecting to them. And so the, the UX just took a very wallet-centric approach but i agree with you like i often ask like some of these wallet flows are so terrible if you had shipped this at facebook when i was there zuck would have thrown you out a window because the ux is so terrible i think at one point some of these games i think it's physically impossible to play axie from the us like there's just literally nothing in the flow chart that ends with you spending money on axie from the us it's literally impossible but part of it is functional in the sense of oh i bought an nft but i sell like i earn a, i earn an nft but i sell it somewhere else that's really kind of only possible if you have some glue between that first pr party game experience and going to OpenSea and selling it. And if I don't have this thing called a wallet, which is basically the basket of goods that I can take anywhere, or at least anywhere where that chain is, it's kind of hard to do. So, I, I mean, we learned this with Reddit, right? So Reddit did an NFT avatar thing. I think they brought almost 10 million people on chain, which is a big number for Web3. But then if you looked at, we did a study on it, like what was the post mint transaction rate for those Reddit wallets? And it was sub 1%. And what's the lesson there? If you handhold somebody on chain, you have to handhold them around the chain, right? Like that's it. They're not going to export that wallet into a real wallet and then do a thing. It never happens basically. And so if you do that, Adam, then you've got to do everything. You've got to build the NFT market. Like everything has to be baked into the product. That just And that just hasn't happened yet, basically. I will say in, in defense of Axie, we're basically the same thing. I have played Axie on chain in the US. <laughs> yeah. I can confirm people in the United States. Uh, but it was a painful experience. And it was my first Web3 experience. And I used to yell at Warren all the time being like, I literally am trying to give you like four figures. <laughs> like it should not be that painful. I want to give one more kind of nuance about this topic, which is where the wallet is a little more seamlessly integrated or more in the background. Um, so, so there are a lot more than are openly discussed. And one reason that these companies have had to be a uh, little quiet about this is because Apple's policy is really unclear. As soon as there's something that's a clear economic transaction in any app, Apple has to have a means for getting its revenue share. Very primordial for their methodologies for how to do that for Web3. We do see that evolving a bit, but a bit poorly defined, or the definitions are just really brutal for these Web3 economies if they follow the letter of the law. It's not something that's necessarily in the interest of companies to draw a lot of attention to if you can do on-chain transactions within the mobile app. And then on PC, I mean, Steam, uh, maybe a year ago, just basically said no blockchain-based games on Steam, period, where they used to have a little more laissez-faire policy on it. Epic has a different policy, and I think there's maybe two or three Web3 games on EGS now, but certainly nothing that has had massive scale and to the point where I don't know if, if those policies will change for steam in the future but right now apple is vague steam is not vague yeah steam says no epic to their credit basically said go for it right that's their policy we just haven't seen massive adoption yet yeah i think i think it's a little early i don't know that their policy is like you know this is great we fully embrace it forever as much as like, yeah, let's see what happens we'll allow it yeah we'll allow we'll allow it probably a good way for now <laughs> i do want to as the last section talk a little bit about the future and where each of you see the future going for your segment and how that interplays with everything else we've talked about today. And we'll start with Anna Smart. We'll go mobile PC, Web3 again. Adam, what's the future hold for mobile mobile games and how they affect everything else that we've discussed today? Well, after yesterday, it's got to be VR, hasn't it? 
I we'll think see. there's very different views on PC and console and mobile, but I do think we are going to see a lot more of this cross-play coming through. Um, and we are going to see a lot of, of mobile companies certainly moving across, whether it's PC in the form of Steam or Epic or the console. We're, I think we're going to start to see lots of trials of this kind of thing, probably more so than we've seen up until this point. And really, it's to... I think it was Adam who alluded to it earlier, actually, with a lot of the security aspects on or privacy aspects on mobile now, people are questioning having all their eggs in one basket, I feel. So I think there's a lot of scope for looking at other platforms. Totally agree. How about you, Adam Lee? What's the future hold for us? Yeah, that's a big question. I think I probably hit a lot of those points throughout the various questions. I think I tried to talk about the future. I definitely think that we're in this sort of golden age of games where there's something for everyone on really any device in any kind of way you want to play. I think that will continue to happen. And I think the more resources that are getting poured into not just development, but also publishing of games is going to mean higher quality games that feel better and monetize better across all these different platforms. I personally really enjoy seeing companies attack some of these problems from different angles, like sort of Adam Swart said. You see Kabam, I think there's an article today that sort of talked about Kabam's really launching their first sort of like PC first title. And it's a company that's been publishing successful mobile games for, I don't know, quite a long time now. We worked with them on some of their early attempts to more or less port games and now working with them on their like actual launch of a PC dedicated product. Really cool to see that angle of attack compared to what we see from other games we work with. Like, I don't warn in my favorite game, Magic the Gathering, which is PC only game for four years, five years before they came out with a mobile SKU and what that looks like. Certainly, we see lots and lots of customers in the, our PC space that are, I don't know, grappling is probably a good word with like Web3, whether they're talking about it publicly, like Square Enix, and either being lauded or hammered, depending on the perspective of folks. and all of the different hybridization around, well, do we do this? What is the the term that I always hear from Solana? Like Web3 in the back. You don't lead with the Web3. You put the Web3 in the back or hidden. The Web3 network. Yeah, the Web3 mullet. It's cool to see all these sort of different different vectors of of trying to build these fun, great gaming experiences that, again, monetize well. So yeah, which one of those would be successful? My short answer is all of them. All of them will have ways to be successful. Gaming is so large, impacts so many people that the things that appeal... There was something really appealing to me about Axie when it first launched about this game of like, how can I make money playing this game? That that actually works for me. I know that's not like a broad gaming experience that most people want, but I like that. I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, oh, wait, you can buy these things and rent them out and other people will play on them and make me money. Like, it's fucking cool. That is a specific gaming experience, whether that's one that should be the way that they necessarily set it up. I don't know, but I do think that there are all sorts of different gaming experiences on different platforms with different technologies that that will continue to be successful. I'm definitely grateful as I've been working in games for 20 years that I get to be at this kind of convergence of all these different companies struggling with these problems and trying to figure it out. Yep, agreed. How about you, Antonio? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Adam just said, which is, I think, again, one of the arguable bugs or features of Web3 is that everything was heavily financialized from day one. And some, some of those aspects, like you said about Axie, were good and kind of cool. On the other hand, sometimes it leans a little bit too far that way, like games that are basically just NFT collections and vehicles for speculation. But if you think about it, at some level, I mean, you mentioned Magic the Gathering. It's a classic example that like literally these physical Magic the Gathering cards are worth thousands of dollars. It, it, it's in my Magic cards right here. Uh, can you? Turn the I mean, camera. Right. I mean, they're basically NFTs before the term existed, right? And so like, why can't you adapt that same game dynamic to on-chain? Or imagine a version of Fortnite where there was like a million dollar purse if you survived, right? Or imagine a car racing game where like you kept the car NFT and it's worth thousands of dollars. It already exists. There's one called Zed Run in which it's a horse racing game and you can actually breed games and stuff. If I was a 15 year old boy with that incentive, I would have disappeared into that cave and not emerged until my 20s, right? And so I I think we need to create those game dynamics. I think there's a lot of aspects of Web3 that would actually complement gaming in a big way. But we just haven't seen an incredible game meet well-implemented Web3 dynamics yet. Awesome. I think with that thought on the future, we're almost at time here. So this has been a meaty discussion, guys. Thank you all so much for making the time today and having this open format conversation between platforms and technologies. I think this has been one of the most interesting episodes to date for us. So thank you all for your time. Awesome. We'll go around and give everyone a chance to sign off. I'll start with you, Adam Smart. If someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about AppSlayer, how can they do that? Sure. LinkedIn. LinkedIn's the ideal. Just look me up, connect. 
Sounds good. Adam Lieb? On Twitter, probably best for me, at Adam S. Lieb. On Twitter, you can go to the game site website, and I'm sure you can click the little blue box and ask for me, but Twitter, tweet at me, I'll, I'll respond. And you, Antonio? Unfortunately, probably also Twitter, Antonio GM at Twitter, open DMs, or go to Spindle XYZ for the website. No, no Telegram? We were so close. You could have t- taken it home with three different technologies for communication. At the end. I'm on Telegram as well. Uh, a underscore Garcia Martinez on Telegram. But my Telegram's a mess. I need to declare Telegram bankruptcy. It's just, it's, yeah. it's beyond the pale. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. Warren, do you want to take us out? Yeah. Thanks again so much, guys. So as always, the podcast was brought to you by our team here at Uptick. Here at Uptick, we do all things help games grow. We do this in two ways. We have our growth services team that does all the cross-disciplinary work to bring the game to market and scale it profitably, the user acquisition and growth marketing work, the data science work, and the creative development work. And then we have our emerging software business as well. This is Teams licensing the Uptick platform that works with attribution and measurement across these various technologies, adding levels of prediction and insights with some of the uptick secret sauce that we use to scale our own games and now you can use to scale yours. So if any of that sounds interesting, we love talking to founders and teams early in their development cycle to help get them on the right track. And you can reach us at uptick.com. That's U-P-P-T-I-C.com. Awesome. Talk soon. Talk soon.